Good morning to all of you this morning. Can y'all hear me okay? Huh? I think you can. You ready to sing? Yes. Well, let's stand. We're going to do, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the Lord. We're going to do it through once, and then we're going to go to in moments like these. Is that something y'all do know? The first one. Okay, no, the first one. We're going to learn the second one together then. Okay, here we go. Let's stand and sing. Good morning out there. Good morning. Are you sure? <laughs> Do you really feel like it's a good morning out there? Yes. Oh, it's always a good morning when we're in the Lord's house, isn't it? I have uh, one announcement that I want to let you know about. Miss Patricia Tool's aunt, Teresa Pass Appling, has passed away. Her visitation will be Wednesday from 5 until 7 p.m. at Owens Funeral Home in Cartersville, and then her service will be 11 a.m. on Thursday morning, also at Owens in Cartersville. I feel like we need to pray this morning. I know that there are several who are hurting, several who are sick this morning, and uh, I'm going to ask that we pray about that specifically this, this day. I'm going to ask you if any of you have a prayer requests that need to be lifted up. Unspoken. Unspoken. Continue to pray for Gene and his test results. Yeah, keep praying for Gene as he has a lot more doctor visits this week. Others? 
Brother Hank, if you will, lead us in a prayer to open our service, but also to pray for all of these prayer requests that have been lifted up. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to just thank you for all the, the good things that you provide us with, Lord, uh, all the comfort that you give us, and uh, we'll also just lift up all the ones that are, uh, have prayer requests, and I know there's more than just the two that were spoken this morning, Lord. Uh, there's many more unspoken prayer requests. We will lift Brother Gene and uh, what's going on with him up to you, Lord, because we know that you have the ultimate and complete uh, healing power yes. uh, to do anything and everything yes. that's, in your, that's in your will, Lord. I want to thank you for uh, just being there for us in our times of need. Uh, when we least expect it and we need you the most, you're always there. Yes. I want to ask that you be with this service this morning, Lord, and just uh, lift, this, uh, lift this service up to you through the, the songs that we sing uh, to you in praise and uh, the worship that goes on from here this morning. Be with Brother Jerry as he brings a message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there's one other thing I'd like to mention uh, to my good buddy Avery over there. I just want to say, go Braves. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, you're down with the Braves? You're, you're, not, you're not counting on Houston to come back and win the next three games. Are you? <laughs> They're going to win the next three games. <laughs> Uh, anything could happen. The Braves sure keep us on the edge of our seats, don't they, right to the end of every game. That is for sure. Well, Avery, you hang in there for Houston. Somebody's got to. And, and the rest of us will cheer our Braves on and hope they come through for us. David, I think that's about enough for me. You lead some worship. Well, let's continue singing those beautiful hymns again. Number seven, if you're looking for the hymnal, it's uh, Joyful, Joyful, the Joy of Thee. Uh, this was written by Ludwig van Beethoven, one of the greatest classical composers I've ever lived. Amen. And so this is his tune. So uh, we're going to keep putting it in words, and this is what we're going to sing. Let's sing all three stanzas. It's number seven, if you need the book. That's okay. Y'all want to stand? Or you like popcorn? Yeah, let's like stand. Let's stand. Let's just get up. <laughs> Let's honor Beethoven, you want to? <laughs> Here we go. Joy, boy.
now I belong to Jesus. So Sherry and I love this song, and so we're going to sing it this morning. No one ever cared for me like Jesus.
8 through 12 today of 1 Peter chapter 3. Yes, children, you may be dismissed to Children's Church. I heard running feet running for the door. That's what reminded me to make that announcement. Not running from your servant. <laughs> now the ones of you should run from my sermon are still sitting here. Is that okay? 1 <laughs> Peter chapter 3. Verses 8 through 12, beginning in verse 8. As always, I'll be reading from my NIV version. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this loving church. Thank you for the beautiful music that we've heard this morning. Thank you for your grace to love us and to care for us and to, to give us the hope of eternal life by sacrificing your only son. And thank you, Jesus, for your bravery and your courage, your willingness to tell us the truth and also to go to the cross for us. I ask, Father, this morning that your Holy Spirit be released in this place and touch all of our hearts that we may go home from this place refreshed and refilled with the power of your Spirit. Knowing that you love us, you have loved us with an everlasting love and that love will carry us to be with you for eternity. All of these blessings we praise your name for and it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you know, we began this series in 1 Peter with a, several sermons that Peter was telling us to submit to the authorities, for example, and then he was telling us that we should submit to others who mistreat us, that we should learn to turn the other cheek when people mistreat us. He was specifically talking to slaves and about their relationships with masters, but it applies to us as well because all of us deal with bosses in this world, with supervisors and that kind of thing. And we also deal with sometimes neighbors and others who 
abuse us, mistreat us, especially verbally. In, in our world, in our country, especially today, there is a lot of verbal picking on people. And a lot of it now is, uh, you know, they don't have to do it face to face. They can go on some social media platform and, and say whatever they want to without confronting the actual person that they're, they're knocking down or, or trying to speak ill of. So we need to learn, though, that no matter what that they do, no matter what happens in the world, we as Christians have the power and therefore should use the power to act like Christians, to behave in a way that a Christian will behave, no matter how we are being treated. No matter what circumstance we are in, we can trust Jesus to work in us and through us and to give us strength for each day and, and joy in our souls and the promise of eternal life. Last week we learned how to behave in the circumstance of marriage. I might have gotten just a little trouble, not too much there, because if you'll recall, there were six verses giving instructions to wives and only one verse giving instructions to husbands. Now, I will admit that is because husbands can only understand one thing at a time. <laughs> so maybe that was what was going on there. It said that wives should submit to your husbands with this one singular purpose of bringing them to salvation by your purity and reverence towards God. The point is that, that wives can make a difference, especially those who are married to husbands who are unsaved, who do not know Jesus Christ, who are lost and are worldly. They can make a difference in that husband's life simply by revering God and serving Him with quietness and purity and love. They can express those things in their marriage to their husbands and by that maybe win their <clears throat> husbands to salvation in Jesus Christ. Husbands, we were told to be considerate and treat your wives with the greatest respect. They are equal to you in that their faith in Jesus gives them exactly the same place in God's kingdom that you hold. And knowing that, you should treat them with the greatest respect because there's no higher place to be than in the family of God. There is no office you could hold that's more important than being part of the family of God. The wives are of great importance in God's eyes. In all of these circumstances, Peter was speaking usually to a specific group of people, but his message was essentially the same. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in, you must behave as a Christian. You must let the Holy Spirit work in your life to bring you to the place where you can act like a Christian and by that I mean behave in a way that is not forcing the world away from you, but drawing the world to Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's our purpose here. Peter emphasizes that the message to the whole church is what he's trying to get through today. He says that at the very beginning. Let's look at verses 8 and 9 again. There it says, Finally, all of you be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. In the previous verse, in the previous verses, Peter has spoken to specific circumstances that Christians will face in their lives and he has told us to submit to various uncomfortable situations for the Lord's sake. The reason when we suffer, the reason when we're in uncomfortable situations, the reason when we're in broken relationships with other people is so that we might show Christ to them even when we are under the pressure 
of bad circumstances, even when we are under the pressure of troubles and fears and anger, we should overcome that by the power of the Holy Spirit and be Christians. We are to behave like Christians in every occasion. In these verses today, he gives us final instructions on how to interact with each other in the church and how to interact with the people who are outside of the church, the people of the world, the people who are currently lost and separated from God. It's important how we act and how we behave towards both of these groups of people. As far as the church, we know that we need to love each other. We're our family. I'll talk more about that. And as far as the world, we are to act in a way towards the world, no matter how they treat us, so that they will be drawn to Jesus Christ and salvation. The Christian church is supposed to live in harmony with one another. In the King James Version, it says here, Be ye all of one mind. Now this doesn't mean we have to have the same opinions about everything. If you know us as human beings, you know that we don't. We all have differing opinions about differing things. For example, Avery and I here, I'm cheering for the Braves even though they get on my nerves. And he's cheering for Houston. Not because he's all that crazy about Houston, but because I'm cheering for the Braves. <laughs> So we have differing opinions. That's just the nature of things. doesn't matter. When we have differing opinions and we're all part of the family of God, we love each other, respect each other, and treat each other fairly because that's the way it's supposed to be. We're family. Remember, all Christians have the same Holy Spirit, so when it comes to our temperament, we should be alike. Calm, easygoing, tender, and peaceful toward each other. Especially with each other. That's the way we should behave towards each other. Because we're family. And we have a deep love for one another. We should be sympathetic towards each other. Striving to understand each other's point of view. And having compassion for each other's struggles. As Christians, this is the way we ought to behave towards one another. We don't belong to a political party. We belong to God's family. And therefore, even though it's okay for us to have different opinions, we should strive to understand each other's opinions and points of view and focus because we all go through struggles and we all go through different struggles. And we all need one another to pray for each other, to lift each other up to God, to come alongside each other and help each other along when we're in trouble. So as family, we should just be compassionate towards one another. We are the family of God. So we must love each other like brothers and sisters. That's really what we are. In God's family, we're all brothers and sisters. We all came there the same way. Didn't we? Sinners in need of salvation. Sinners coming to a holy and righteous Savior who gave His life on the cross for us. Sinners who had to surrender themselves to one who is greater and holier and higher and let His Holy Spirit be in control of us. Each one of us comes to God that way. There is no other way. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. There is no other way but Him. We must come to this salvation, this family of God. People in need of help and a Savior who has died for us must receive Him. So every Christian comes to the family of God that way. Therefore, none of us are above the other. None of us are better than the other. We are all as good as we can be because we belong to God's kingdom. And we all love each other because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We must be caring and humble, not thinking of ourselves and our feelings, to be any more important than the next Christian's person and feelings. We have to receive each other and love each other, even when we disagree. Now we are blessed in this church to rarely disagree. For the most part, we just are happy to be together. And that's a blessing. It's not like that everywhere, and that's okay too. 
But no matter what the circumstance, we need to behave like brothers and sisters towards each other. This is how Christians should interact with each other. Now let's look at how we should interact with the world. We just talked about how we should interact with each other as family, as loving family and caring family. But this is how we should interact with the world. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. There is nothing to be said for getting even. You hear me? That's worldly thinking. That's what the world thinks. I'm going to get even. I'm going to show them. There's nothing to be gained by that. There's no salvation in that for anybody. You hear me? No one gains eternal life through getting even with the next person. So when they pay you evil, you pay them love. When they use you and abuse you with their words, you reply with blessing. That's the way that somebody may come to Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Vengeance has no place in the life of a Christian. It only belongs to the Lord God. He is the righteous judge and He will judge all of us when we leave this world. We want to be judged lovers of God, lovers of the brethren, and people who led people to salvation. Now, Exercising retribution is hard enough. It's hard enough for us to step away from that. We would like to, in our personalities, you know, get even. We would like to. In our humanity, in our flesh, we would like to. In our human natures, we would like to. But exercising retribution is hard enough. But Peter says, we must respond to evil and insults by doing good and pronouncing blessings. If it, as if it weren't hard enough just to keep your temper under control when dealing with the world. You have to go even further. You have to answer that by blessing those who curse you. Peter says that it's our calling to do this, to bless those who insult and abuse us. Now, we have a hard time doing that in our flesh. So how do we do it? We do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do it in the strength of the one who died on the cross for all of our abuse and sins towards God. He, though having the power of God, gave himself fully and died in our place on the cross with people insulting him and being angry towards him and his last words about them were Lord forgive them they know not what they do that's how we respond with the power of his spirit that is within us when we have invited him into our souls to be our Lord and Savior when we give up thinking we have to have control and turn to God and say I believe in your son Jesus Christ that He died on the cross for my sins and that He rose from the dead to offer me eternal life. I put all my trust and faith in Him. When we do that, it changes us for always. And it puts us in the place where we have to bless those who curse us. In all circumstances, Christians must be willing to do that. There's a good reason for it, though. There's a promise of a blessing for us. If we act in this way, in this Christian manner, if we, we are willing to receive abuse and answer it in God's love and with His blessing, then He promises blessings for us. If we act like Christians, even when it's hard to do. And we, even when it's unfair. He's made a promise to us. I'm going to read verses 10 and 11 to you. Actually, well, we'll look at just 10 and 11 right now. Verse 10, it says, For 
Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Now these two verses especially, but I, 10 through 12 actually, are Peter repeating to them, quoting to them from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16a. Now these verses are tied together, 10 and 11 and 12 are tied together with verse 9, where Peter is echoing the words of Paul and Jesus. Paul said in Romans 12, 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. And Peter is telling us the same thing in, in these two verses, in verse 10 and 11. Jesus, though, had said in Luke 6, 27 through 28, I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. That's hard for us to do in our human flesh, isn't it? That's hard for us to do, but that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did on the cross, all the way to the cross. All the abuse, physical, emotional, and spiritual abuse that He took. Plus, being separated from God His Father for the first time in His existence. All of that He took without abusing or cursing or speaking against those who were doing it to him. In fact, he asked God to forgive them. I'm going to read to you those words again from Psalm 34, but also uh, here from verses 10 and 11. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Thomas R. Schreiner, Schreiner, excuse me, paraphrases these verses beginning with verse 9 in this way. You were called to bless, you remember, Peter told them to bless those who mistreat them. You were called to bless so that you will inherit the blessing of eternal life. For anyone who wishes to experience the life of the age to come, the life, the eternal life that's waiting for us, must shun evil speech and do good to all in order to receive that blessing. What he's really saying to us here is if you want to experience the blessing that comes in eternal life, you must let the Holy Spirit be in control of your speech and your reactions and your temptation to be angry. You must give all of that to the Lord and let Him overcome the problems that you have there. Finally, let's look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now I've been talking with someone recently about this idea of once saved, always being saved. That's what I believe, because I don't believe salvation comes from anything that we do or, or think. It comes through the work of Jesus Christ Himself. And His Holy Spirit coming into us is what gives us salvation. It is nothing other than Jesus cares enough about us to come into us. Our only part into it, our only part at all, is to receive Him. He does all the work. He paid all the price on the cross. He has all the power in His Holy Spirit. And He comes to us when we are lost. And outside of His Grace in His presence. And through Him we are given eternal life and salvation. Jesus did all the work. So how can you lose something you never gained? It was given to you. You cannot lose your salvation through your behavior. That's the, 
You know, it don't seem right, does it? But that's because it's not right. The only thing that's right is what Jesus did. And your behavior, sad to say, is inconsequential to your salvation because your salvation belongs to Christ, given to you by Him. Sustained in you by Him. That does not mean that God will allow you to act any way you want to. And I'm going to say this to you. This is me being judgy. I'm, I might be wrong about this. I don't think I am. If you act like the devil after you've been saved, you've never been saved. If you act like the devil when the Holy Spirit's supposed to be in your life, you're lying to yourself. If you still run in sin and nothing else, if you are angry all the time and never happy, if you have all of those bitterness feelings in yourself, you may not be saved at all. Because again, it's not whether you came down an aisle and knelt in an altar and said a prayer. It's did Jesus come into your heart? If He did, you know it. And you're changed. But if you still walk in the ways of sin and talk in the ways of sin and act in the ways of sin, you need to ask yourself, have I ever really made a contact with Christ and come into a relationship with Him? Did He come in? Or did I just talk to myself? It is profitable for us to behave like Christians, the Christians that we're supposed to be, in every circumstance of life, whether they be good or bad, whether it be blessing or suffering, it is profitable for us to act like Christians, to behave in the way that a Christian would. Because our God is always looking out for us and He is listening for our prayers. And as He listens to our prayers, He has secured for us eternal life through the sacrifice of His only begotten Son, Jesus. That should be enough motivation right there that we have eternal life in Christ and that we're going to spend eternity in God's heaven for us to behave like Christians. And we have the power to do so if we are truly in Christ, if we have truly received Him by the power of His Holy Spirit. It says here, though, that God turns His face away from those who do evil. And He does not have to listen to their prayers unless they pray a prayer of repentance of their sins and ask for Jesus to come into their heart. If you belong to Jesus, if you are a saved person, when you pray, God listens and He responds. He may not always respond in the way you think that He will, but He always will respond to His children. But if you do not belong to Jesus Christ, if you have never been saved, I'm here to tell you He does not have to listen to your prayers. Now sometimes He will intervene for people out of His love, but He does not have to listen to the prayers of those who don't belong to Him. For those who walk in evil, He does not have to listen to their prayers except for one. He will always listen. By His choice, He will always listen if you repent of your sin and ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. That prayer, God will always listen to. If evildoers do not repent, then even though Peter did not quote this part of verse 16 in the Psalm 34, there was an A and a B. I told you he quoted through A. This is what it says in 16B of Psalm 34. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Now that's a death and separation where you don't exist in the presence of God. And I think this even means for your saved loved ones, 
If you go to hell because you refuse to receive Jesus, even the memory of you is gone. Because there are no tears in heaven. The time to cry for lost loved ones is now, while there's still a chance that they will come to Jesus. We're going to close our service right here. David's going to come and lead us in an invitation hymn. And those of you who are here, I invite you to come to this altar and just pray if you want to. Whatever your need is, you come. Those who are watching on video, Jesus will come into your heart if you sincerely repent of your sins and ask Him to come into your heart. And I beg you to do that wherever you are this morning because He is everywhere waiting to hear that prayer. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, I'm coming home 309. 309. Can we stand together, please?